Good morning, First Baptist. Oh, one day, one day, this room is going to be full of people again at 9.15 and again at 10.30 because we lift up Jesus in this house and we will not be able to contain ourselves, but we'll have to tell our friends about what Jesus does and they'll want to be here. That's the way this thing works. Good morning. Thank you for coming to First Baptist this morning. I know that many of you have heard that uh, my father-in-law passed away yesterday morning. Thank you for all the expressions of, uh, of uh, sympathy that you've given to the family. Uh, it's one of those bittersweet things that many, many of you have gone through. Ray had a, a major stroke nine years ago that wiped out his short-term memory. And then about four years ago, he had a a series of seizures that took away some more stuff. So he had been ill for a long, long time. Uh, So we hate to see him go, but we know that he's got it all back now. He is in, uh, he is walking in glory. He's in the new Eden, something we're going to talk about this morning. And he had hope because Jesus was his savior. You can't fight that. That's the best stuff going. We want you this morning to feel like you're at home if you're visiting with us. We're going to make sure that we're going to reach out to folks we don't recognize and say hello to them. If you're home folks, our desire at First Baptist is to be a place where people find Jesus and give Jesus away. I wrote this on Thursday and did not, you, you write things and you don't understand how they're going to fit later, you know? They mean one thing, you write them and then something else comes. I wrote, often we find Jesus in the most unlikely places, in a touch, a smile, a kind word, or a hug of comfort. And we give Jesus the same way, by knowing and sometimes unknowingly doing the things that we do to love each other with a simple touch. And then Ray passes away and we have been touched over and over and over again and you feel Jesus when that happens. It's really, really cool. And if you don't have Jesus in your life this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit would touch you one more time and let you know that there is something really good out there that you need more than anything else in the world. Pray with me, would you? Father, we thank you this morning for the beauty of this creation that you created just for us. I pray, Lord, uh, as as I drove down here this morning and looked at the the different colors of grass on the side of the road and the bird flying over the highway in front of me and all all of the trees and the clouds in the sky and all this stuff, Lord, it is such a beautiful place to be. And then we come here, and Lord, we're among friends. Lord, we love each other. We care for each other. Lord, we're happy to be here. And we are here because of you, that you called us to this place. You created the church, and we're your body, and we thank you so much for that. I pray this morning that you would be praised, that your name would be lifted up. That even though it's 9.15 in the morning, Lord, we would be energized to worship you, to call your name out because you are our holy, omnipotent God. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ken. uh, It's interesting. I'm glad that uh, Logan and I had talked about the service the sermon and music and all that kind of stuff earlier in the week and I told him what I, where I thought we would end up going and he said well we, we need to do the music a little because of this that and the other and I said well that's good let's do that and I sure am glad he didn't go where I was going because we didn't go there this scripture uh, that we're looking at Genesis chapter 2 go ahead and look about in your Bibles Genesis chapter 2 we're going to be going through it this morning reading it as we go along this scripture uh, ends with uh, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman for she is taken for the man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. And that lends itself to talking about marriage and going to Ephesians 5 because it's a picture of the church. And all that works real pretty together. But then you start going through the text and you start realizing there's so much stuff in here that, that we 
need to understand to get this story out of the fairy tale realm and get it into the reality of what God has done for us that we'll have to go there another day. So y'all lucked out on the marriage thing. It's going to be talked about, but it's all a part of the bigger thing. And this is good. Guys, this is not a fairy tale. You've heard it a million times and you, you grow up, one of the first things we start with with kids in Sunday school is talking about the creation story and, and it gets positioned in our head sort of an interesting way and, and we want to get beyond that. Have you ever heard anybody say that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then man came in and messed it all up? Y'all realize that's wrong, right? You do realize that there is no truth in that statement whatsoever. There are trivia moments, get ready, you'll be able to use this in a trivia contest somewhere. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. Commit that to memory so that when they ask the question, you can go, I know, 1,189 books of uh, uh, chapters in the Bible. The first two talk about how God created this world perfectly exactly as he wanted to be created the last two the last two talk about the new heaven and the new earth and talk about the new Eden in fact my Bible even has one of those little header things that says the new Eden so you've got the first two that talk about the beginning creation the last two talk about the ending creation and the 1185 chapters in the middle are not a chronicle of how God cleaned up the mess that we made they are not. We like to think that God created this picture and gave us coloring crayons and we immediately started coloring outside of the lines. But when you back up and you look at what God has done for us and with us and the way he did this, when you look at it from his perspective, you start realizing right quick that, that God, that we never colored outside of the lines, that God knew Although it's not said in the creation story, we learn from the cross of Christ that from the very beginning, God knew that the cross was the essential element that would be there in order to take us from the original Eden to the final Eden which he wants us to be in. He knew that all along that the cross had to be there and that 1185 chapters is him show... That wasn't me whistling. Was... Him showing us, him showing us how he was going to get us there the whole time. This was not a mistake. And let's get something else out of the way. I want to say this just plain and simple. This is not a creation myth. This is not a creation myth. Words are important. A lot of people over the last 50 years, 7,500 years have talked about the creation mythology. A myth is... A myth is, a synonym for myth is folk tale, folk story, legend, tale, story, fable, saga, mythos, lore, and folklore. And what all of those mean is, is we didn't know, understand how something happened, so we made up a story to fill in the blanks. Let me tell you what I believe. I believe that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that what the scripture said happened is exactly happened, that it is divinely inspired and I believe with all of my heart that the things that are written here, the things that are written here explain the restlessness that we all feel inside ourselves because our restlessness is a craving for what God has created. I truly believe that with all of my heart. The restlessness that all of us feel. And you say, well, I don't know that I feel restless. As we go through the message this morning, we're going to talk about several places that restlessness occurs in our lives. And it all occurs because we are wanting this. And if we listen to that restlessness, it will drive us to the place that we need to go. Now, what are we talking about? Get your Bibles. Genesis 2, we're going to read it piece at a time and then go through it a piece at a time Genesis 2 4 through 7 these are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation at that time the Lord God made the earth and the heavens no shrub of the earth had yet grown on the land and no plant of the field had yet sprouted for the Lord God had not made it rain on the land and listen there was no man to work the ground hear that there was no man to work the ground 
Then the Lord, how far am I going? Seven. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. Million things to talk about in here. I mean, I just, when I sit down and start studying this, I make more notes than I have ever made when I've studied for sermons ever. So we can't cover everything. We're going to hit the big stuff. And the first thing we're going to hit is a four-letter word that none of us like. Four letters. W-O-R-K. Work. Anybody in the morning, and some of you may, some of you may. Anybody in the morning looking forward to getting up at, I don't know, 4, 4 5 o'clock to go to work? Yeah, maybe a couple of people. Okay, there's one or two that enjoy their work. Everybody else is going, eh, it's a classroom full of kids, you know. I'm going to the hospital and a bunch of sick folk. And it's, you know, everybody's got a gripe and a complaint. And it's just work. But right here in the scripture, it tells us there was no one to work the ground. Which means that God created somebody to work. Have you ever wondered why, and, 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 and some people are going to say, no, I've never wondered why, and it, it could be because you fall in the category. Have you ever wondered why lazy people get on your nerves? Have you ever wondered why? It, well, because God created us to work. Have you ever wondered why social programs, I did whistle that time, social programs where we give money to people and don't expect anything from them, why that doesn't lift them out of poverty and make them into the people that we think everybody ought to be? It's because God created us to work. And when we get things without working, it loses that pride that God put into us. He created us to work. Now hold that thought. We're going to bring it back in a few minutes. God designed us to work. Look at verse 7. It says, then the Lord God formed. Now the word formed here hints at or, or tells us that God did this with intentionality. He, informed, he, he formed us on purpose. Now, sometimes people have babies that it's an oopsie, you know. You just, one day you wake up and you find out you're going to have a baby and everybody goes, oh, I'm going to have a baby. But most times, couples are, are sort of planning for that child. And when they have the child and find out they're pregnant, they go on Facebook and they post their pictures of their sonogram. That's just what you do now. And everybody's excited because we're having a baby. We plan for it. We're forming a child. We want this child. And when the child's born, we love it and we lavish on it because that's what we wanted to do. Adoption is a good picture of that too. You have a couple that wants a child but for whatever reason can't have it or just feels like they need to go out and reach out and find that child and then bring them into their life and love on that child and lavish that child with love. That's what formed means. That's what God did with us. He intentionally created us. Now listen, he says, it, the scripture says, breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and the man became a living being. That, didn't, that doesn't mean that he just animated the dust. Doesn't mean that all of a sudden the dust just got up and started doing the hokey pokey. That's not what it was saying. What he's saying here is the breath of life gave Adam, listen, gave Adam the capacity to speak to God. Not just to speak, but to speak to God. To walk with God. To know where God wanted him to go. And to know what God wanted him to do. Remember when we studied John and Jesus, after the resurrection, and Jesus came back to the disciples and he breathed on him and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What did we say happened? They breathed in his breath. They were surrounded by his breath. Once again, back in that relationship where we can know what God wants, know where God wants us to to go that we can speak with God every moment, day by day. That's what we were created for. That's what we were created. Do you understand the creation story isn't just to explain how people got here, but it also explains why people got here and why people are the crowning creation of God. Next set of scriptures, uh, 8 through 14. 14 is there. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. 
The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there it was divided and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure. Bedelium and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Jehan, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, which runs east of the uh, east of Assyria, and the fourth river, fourth river is the Euphrates. I should get a bonus for pronouncing all those words. 8 through 14, real quick. After God created Adam, he created the, he created the Garden of Eden. And very simply, Eden was the place where Adam could have everything that his heart desired. Eden was the place where Adam could have everything that his heart desired. It was a beautiful place. It was pleasing in appearance. It was a place where his work would be profitable. Remember, there was no man to cultivate the ground. Now there is a man to cultivate the ground, to do the work. His work would be profitable. It's a place where profitable work. Profitable work is when you go home at the end of the day and all of you have done it, even you guys in school, you've done this. You had that day where you come home and you are tired. You are bone-weary tired, but it's a good tired. I did something today. I accomplished something today. Today what I did meant something to me and to somebody else. It was a good day. Every day was a good day in Eden. That's the kind of work that he had. That's the kind of work that, that, uh, that Adam, that God put for Adam there. But it was a place where life could be found, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden. But it's also a place where obedience and loyalty to God was commanded. Because there was the tree of life, right, in the middle of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I don't know about the placement of all of that. And I'll explore that one of these days. But he makes a point, I think, doesn't he? To say that the tree of life is in the middle of the garden. As well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's like life is in the middle. The other one's on the outskirts. Don't know what that means. It just sort of rings in my head a little bit. In Revelation 22... Okay, what did I say? First two chapters is about the way God created it. Revelation 21 and 22 is the new Eden at the end. There's only one tree there. That's the tree of life. Because see, at that point, everybody's going to have made their decision. They're going to decide whether they want to obey God or not obey God. They're going to follow good or they're going to follow evil. The decision's been made at that point. And the ones that have decided to go tree of life or that are going to follow Christ, they're going to be in the new Eden. And all of those who chose against it aren't. It's a pretty simple equation, you know. It's the way it works. 2.15, the Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. All right. How do I make this as exciting to you guys as it was to me? you got to work with me here because this is where our restlessness, one of the places that our restlessness is found. Have you ever thought, back up, back up. I worked for the Washington County Road Department when I first became, got out of seminary, graduated, got the letters behind my name, Thought I was going to be Billy Graham. Some church with a thousand members was going to call me because I was the best preacher that ever walked on the face of the earth. I had a professor that told me one time, you are one of the best preachers that we've ever had. And I'm going, whoa, I'm the man. Yeah, I got a church with 30 people out in the country. Because, see, I wasn't the man. I just thought I was the man. And God had to help me understand who the man really was. So I was at the Belurma Baptist Church in Hancock County. And I looked for a job and looked for a job, and finally I got to be the clerk of the Washington County Road Department. I started out as a dump truck driver, but then my boss found out that I could use a computer, and he brought me in the office. And here's what my job was. Every day, all of the work crews would go out and do their job. They would clean ditches. They would, uh, a lot of dirt roads in Washington County, so they'd scrape the roads. And at the end of the day, they would bring their log sheets into the office. And the next day, I would sit there and type all of those log sheets into the computer. 
to print them out in a nice orderly fashion to bind them together and put them in a box so they could go to a warehouse. In the off chance that one day Wright Barksdale calls up and says, my road hasn't been graded in a year, we could go pull out that file and show Wright Barksdale that we did indeed grade his road. Do you know how many times Wright called? He didn't live down there, I'm just picking on Wright. Once in the two years I was there, that was the most worthless job I ever had in my life. I'd go home at the end of the day going, what am I doing? I sit here and type all day long. Every now and then I get lucky and I can call somebody on the radio and tell them to go somewhere. But for the most part, my job is to sit here and type useless information into a useless computer so that it can be put into a useless box and put into a warehouse. Have you ever felt that your job was that way? You get real restless when that happens, don't you? When you feel that your job is meaningless or sometimes the more you do, the behinder you get. I know you, the ones of you that are school teachers because I've heard some of the complaints that y'all have. If you'll just let me teach and quit making me do paperwork and meetings and all of this other stuff, if I can just do the children and there's a restlessness that's involved there. Sometimes you get to the point in life that if I could just disappear, nobody would even notice. If I was just gone, nobody would, pff, job would keep running, life would keep going, everything would just keep moving restlessness now here's here here the root word God placed Adam in the garden God placed God did not put him in the garden God placed him in the garden the word placed is built on the root word rest now here's how to understand that word you people that have gone on vacation this year have almost caused me and others to sin. I have mentioned that to you before. You have gone to some beautiful places this year. I haven't been to the beach in five years, and I've got beach fever. I want to go. I'm that guy that looks like a beached whale laying on the beach. You know, you're walking, and this white glare is, is hurt. That's me laying on the beach, you know, just too much white laying there. I'm dying to be there. And I've seen your pictures of the water and the waves and walking on the beach and eating seafood. And you guys that have gone to the mountains and I see the pictures of the mountains and I see the pictures of, of waterfalls and all the places that you've gone. It's gorgeous. And I'm looking at this stuff wishing that I could be there. But you know what all of you have in common? I bet every one of you said it. I'd be surprised if a one of you didn't. You go on vacation for three days, a week, two weeks, and you come home and you say, we had a great time on vacation, but I sure am glad to be in my home sleeping in my bed tonight. Do you not say that? That's placed. That's placed. God placed him in the garden. When he got there, he went, this is where I belong. This is home. Everything wrapped up into one, satisfaction, contentment, belonging, God placed him. Now, there are two more words to look at here. The first word, again, is God placed him in the garden to work it. Y'all stay with me. To work it and to watch over it, all right? The word for work is used repeatedly five in the first five books of the Bible. The word for work, the same word that's used right here, is used repeatedly in the first five books of the Bible to indicate religious service. Now see how, I know this is too deep for early in the morning. This ought to be an afternoon thing, you know, where we're all sitting down in a room talking about all this stuff. Your work, my work, is a religious service to God. He created you for work. And what you do is religious service to him. It's the way we were designed. It's what we're supposed to do. And part of the restlessness we feel sometimes is because we, we're doing our work for whatever reason we come up to, and we forget the fact that what we are doing is religious service to God. It's where our restlessness comes from. We work for a lot of reasons now and forget that. But then the second phrase here is the one that's the killer. There's a phrase that says, and watch over it. Now, 
we have the idea of the farmer, right? Watching his crops grow. Isn't that like watching paint dry? It's like me standing here going, well, I'm going to watch over the congregation. Yep, there's a congregation out there. Sure enough. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a congregation. Whoop, what I'm just left. Yep, well, well, there's a congregation. That's what it is. That's what we have in our mind. That's the wrong. That's wrong. That's not the way this word is meant here. When this word talks about watching over it, watch here is a word used for keeping God's, listen, for keeping God's commands and paying attention to make sure that everything, everything obeys God's word. So Adam was placed to work as a service to God and to make sure that everything under his control did what God told it to do. That's what watch over means. So now here we get to this is the place that Adam failed. This is where Adam failed Eve. He didn't watch over her. Now, before you, you women get all wrinkled up about, I don't need anybody watching me, or yeah, well, yeah, whatever. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But he's not watching over her like a, 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 a parent watches over a child. But he had responsibility. We'll find she's culpable. She, she made her own mess too. But we'll understand that Adam was to protect everything. Adam was to make sure that everything obeyed God's commands. Everything in that garden did what God had commanded them to do, and Adam didn't do that. And here's what I want you to think about. Adam lived with that failure for the rest of his life. I want you to think about this. When Adam and Eve had their child after the fall, after the curse, and she is screaming in agony as she delivers this baby, he's leaning back going, that's my fault. That's my fault. When he's working himself to death out in the field, and it's not growing like it's supposed to grow, and there's weeds, and I, I don't know about you guys, I do not enjoy gardens. I think whoever invented gardens, I guess that's God, I need to be careful. I do not enjoy gardens because gardens get weeds in them and you can't always hoe the weeds out. You have to get on your blooming hands and knees and pull the weeds out of the garden. There ain't nothing fun about that. And if you think it is fun, there's something wrong with you and you need help. There is nothing good in, in that whole idea. And yet, when Adam's pulling those weeds, he's going, this is my fault. Now, here's what I, what I want to ask you. Have you ever done that yourself? You've leaned back after you've done something and you knew the right thing to do, but you did something else anyway. And you made a big old mess. And then you lean back and you go, that was my fault. I caused this. This is mine. The good news is, is there's 1185 chapters of the Bible telling us that God has made a way for us to put all of that behind us and to go to the last two chapters of the Bible. Do not ever believe, I've said this 50 times, I hope I say it 100 more before I'm out of this place. Do not let anybody tell you that you've made a decision that ruined your life. It just put it on a different trajectory. You may do something heinous, horrible, and awful, but it did not ruin your life because the cross of Jesus Christ says that you get your sins washed away, you get made new, and you get to have a life that gives glory and honor to him. No matter what, no matter what, you can't ruin your life. You can put it on a different trajectory, but you can't ruin it. Now, Genesis 2, 16, 17. Okay, 16, 17. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. The first time the word command is used is right here. If there's a command, then there's a possibility that you will disobey the command, right? So we've got the two trees, and that lets us know. We could choose goodness and life, that's if we follow the command, or we can choose evil and death, and that's if we don't follow the, the command. Now, more mythology to dispel here. I know I'm teaching a lot of stuff. Y'all stay with me because this is, this is good. Adam and Eve didn't rip and romp through the garden like two little children. We have, I've seen cartoons with that, and I've seen movies with that, where Adam and Eve are racing around the garden, sort of playing hide-and-go-seek, you know, grown people with children's minds, and they're running around, and she's giggling all of these little giggly, girlish, flirtatious little sounds that, that girls can make, and he's chasing her around, and they're having their little good time and doing it. That's garbage. That is not true. That is not how the garden worked. We have developed this notion, not that they were innocent, but that they were naive, that they just didn't know better. And that when that tree was there, she just didn't realize that if she ate of that tree that it was going to be a big deal. That is totally wrong. They, Adam had God's breath in his nostrils. He had God's spirit. Adam had everything necessary to completely understand the full implications of his actions. And furthermore, while God knew the choice that Adam would make, Adam was fully capable to keep this command. And that's why this is so tragic to me and why it should resonate with you as well. How many times have you said this? Or maybe you've never said it. Maybe I'm the only one that's ever said this in my whole life. But I've leaned back a couple of times in my life and said, why did I do that? Why did I do that? For heaven's sakes, I knew before I ever did it. I knew before I ever went out with that girl. I knew before I ever took that job. I knew before I ever did that that was the wrong thing to do, and I did it anyway. Am I the only one that's ever done that? Or have any of y'all had that same experience where you've had to lean back and go, why did I do that? Alan Ross said, the man who was created with spiritual capacity and provided with God's bounty must therefore live obediently in the service of God for his life is at stake. I had a friend, I had a friend whose dad was a very, 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 very large man. Very large man. Understand, a very large man. He enjoyed his food and he enjoyed drinking adult beverages in copious quantities and he went to his doctor and he told and his doctor told him look dude trying to scare him if you don't lose weight and you don't quit drinking you're going to be dead in three months he's trying to scare him rattling he said I enjoy life and this is the way I'm going to live and strangely enough the doctor's prophecy came true that in three months, the guy was dead. I don't, I don't know that always happens with you doctor folks, but this time it happened. He died. He knew what he was supposed to do, but he made a different choice. How many times have we done that? Then Genesis 2, 18 through 25 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. The Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought every, each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the rib, closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into the woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. Both the man and the woman were naked and felt no shame. All right. 
I totally lost my place. Well, that's sweet. Where do we go? I guess that was right there. Did I turn the page too quick? Yeah, that's what I did. Okay, here we are. It's not good for the man to be alone. That is not God saying I made a mistake. Y'all know sometimes you have to have, uh, you have to be proven what you know. Parents, y'all have children, you've let them do things you know is going to turn out badly. Not things that will hurt them, but you let them do it. It's going to turn out badly. You know it's going to turn out badly, but you let them do it anyway because they're just doggone stubborn and pig-headed, and they just got their mindset that this is a way that I need to do it, that you just lean back and say, well, go ahead. Yeah, have a good time. Let me know how this works for you. And then when they get through and they come back in and they're all down and upset and everything, you don't say, I told you so. You just sit there and smile at them. And they know, they know, they know. That's what God did with Adam here. He had to help Adam understand that you can't do this alone, dude. You can't do this alone. This whole creation and all this work that I've got you to, to do out here, I've created you in a way to have a relationship. You've got to have somebody to do it with. And that's how God created life. This is not to disparage singleness because we're all called to be single for a season and some people are called to be single forever. But God's design is a man and a woman together for life. There is no other design. You can argue with me, you can tell me, you can give me, and I don't care what you say. It is God's design is a man and a woman for life. He, formed, he didn't form Eve from the dust of the ground. He formed Eve from Adam's rib. From the beginning, they were designed to be inextricably linked with one another. He says, I will make a helper corresponding to him. And this is where our language fails us. Because the word helper indicates something subordinate to somebody else. One of my jobs I had was as a plumber's helper. I always had trouble with that terminology because the plunger you use to unclog your toilet is also called a plumber's helper. And so when someone would say, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a plumber's helper. I had in their, I was envisioning, they're thinking in their mind, mm -hmm. yeah, I know what you are. That's why, you know, you're just a little helper. It's a subordinate kind of idea. But then you look in Psalm 46 and it says, God is our refuge and strength a helper. So God is a helper. So it can't be subordinate, can it? I mean, God's not subordinate to us. What the word helper means is that's somebody who provides what's lacking for the other person. That's what a helper is. They provide what is lacking for the other person. So together we can do what neither of us could do by ourselves. Humans were created. They cannot fulfill their destiny except in mutual assistance. And ladies, don't, don't get all, see, I told you, honey, you can't do anything without me. I have been told that before. <clears throat> and it's sort of true, but at the same time, you can't do anything without me. You can do your thing, I can do my thing, but together we get done the job that God has called us to do. We have to have each other corresponding to him. All right, almost done. Here's a source of restlessness. Everybody that has ever had a relationship break up knows the restlessness. Whether you broke up with your girlfriend, you broke up with your boyfriend, your, your marriage ended up in divorce, that's, that's breaking up on steroids. No matter what happens there, all of us have leaned back and said, it's not supposed to be that way. And you're right. It's not. This is the way it was supposed to be. Every person knows that feeling. But both the man and the woman were naked and felt no shame. It's because there was no sin. And she knew that he had her back. And he knew that she had his back. And that neither one was going to exploit the other one that they truly were looking out for each other. And I think that probably was a big cause of Adam having some angst after the fall because he realized, I did not have Eve's back. I should have stopped her. It was my job. And I didn't do it. It's how we were designed. It's how we were designed. And it's how we're going to live one day. 1,185 chapters. 
are telling us verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, this is how God's plan is going to unfold. And God walks us right up to Calvary. We're going to see him before the cross of Christ. That causes our restlessness to get even worse because everything that we have as sin is held up in front of us and we look at him and say we would do better if we could, but we can't. We need a savior and he says, follow me. And then I will take you and place you where you're supposed to go. And that's the story. That's a lot of stuff. Y'all pray with me. Old hymn, old, old hymn. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain. Free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. Near the cross, I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand just beyond the river. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my ransomed soul shall find rest beyond the river. Father, we thank you for the cross that will make us one day be able to live in Eden with you and until that time father we pray you hold us close and teach us that we can hear your voice and that we can do what you've called us to do and i pray this morning you're calling out to someone in the midst of their restlessness to come home in jesus name amen you've heard the invitation if god is stirring you i invite you to come this morning and talk to me and let me talk to you about how to know how to go home and for the rest of us this is what we were designed for I hope I know there was a lot of stuff and I'm, I'm working on all of that trying to work the delivery a little bit but I hope that you caught the fact that you are very special and the work you do is very special that what we do was given to us by God to do as his service what you do is important, very important. Don't ever think that it's not. And thank him for that this morning. Let's stand together.